So thank you uh, for everyone. Thank you to the Secretariat and the organizers. Uh, Victor Pinga is the name. I serve as Agriculture Advisor to the Spring Project. And I believe there may be some people uh, on the call today that are not familiar with Spring. So allow me to spend you know, maybe just a few minutes, a couple of minutes uh, on explaining what Spring is. Spring is a nutrition project. It stands for Strengthening Partnerships, uh, Results, and Innovations in Nutrition Globally. Uh, and we partner with a lot of uh, institutions uh, uh, around the world, you know, and not just U.S.-based organizations. Uh, we are a consortium project funded by the USAID, and the consortium consists of JSI as lead organization, Helen Keller International, IFPRI, Save the Children, and the Manoff Group. So uh, our aim is to strengthen global and country efforts to scale up high-impact nutrition practices and policies. And we basically provide technical support. Uh, and some of the areas that we work in are, you know, stunting and anemia in the first thousand days, you know, uh, creating social and behavior change uh, through communications, uh, strengthening systems for nutrition. Uh, and my area within Spring, which is providing support in the area of uh, nutrition sensitive agriculture. I think uh, previously we were calling it, you know, linking uh, agriculture and nutrition, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I believe now nutrition sensitive agriculture, that term is, uh, has gained traction. Uh, so we are a global nutrition project with presence in seven countries, uh, more or less. It, it varies by the year, and we pro but we provide support uh, in many other countries. Now, in nutrition sensitive ag, uh, we primarily support the U.S. government's efforts uh, in uh, sharing learning, uh, providing technical assistance, and contributing to the evidence base in this growing uh, field of agriculture nutrition. And our uh, efforts really come primarily as a result of the series of Ag and GLEES, or the Agriculture Nutrition Global Learning Evidence Exchanges that we organized on behalf of USAID in 2012-2013. Now, since then, uh, in Ag Nutrition, we have supported uh, the government's uh, Feed the Future initiative, which has the twin objectives of inclus inclusive agriculture sector growth and improved nutritional status of women and children. So as you see, uh, we really are in the center of this agriculture, nutrition, linkages, and all that. Now for today's briefing, we were asked to talk about one or two very practical experiences in doing nutrition-sensitive ag. Uh, I am one of two ag advisors uh, in the project. So today I've chosen two examples uh, that I'm most familiar with, and I will talk about our nutrition agriculture work in Ghana, uh, as well as Sierra Leone. Uh, in Ghana, uh, we are part of a larger effort in nutrition and reducing stunting rates in the northern regions of Ghana in the country. And we have a smaller component that deals with agriculture. Now, our footprint in agriculture is smaller because there are larger and dedicated efforts under Feed the Future. And they all tackle, you know, uh, the value chains, agricultural technical transfer, extension, uh, among other things. You know, and these are run by other agencies, and we coordinate and collaborate with them, you know, through the Feed the Future. Uh, and we are all guided by the uh, country Feed the Future multi-year strategy, and our results contribute to, to that larger uh, effort, you know, government-wide. Now, since we have a smaller component in agriculture, we have chosen to deal with a crop, a single crop, yes, uh, not so much a food system, which is so big. Uh, but we chose this crop because uh, it's not tackled in a major way by the larger ag value chain projects. And this crop is groundnuts or peanuts. Of course, other people are also uh, involved in peanuts. Uh, groundnuts are women's crop, and so most of our and most of our target thousand-day households produce some amount of groundnuts, mostly for home consumption, but also for sale. So as you can imagine, with groundnuts, we are potentially changing uh, three pathways to nutrition you know, home for food production, uh, income, as well as women's empowerment. So by improving the quality and quantity of small-scale groundnut production, we're potentially increasing income that is controlled by women, and therefore it has greater potential to contribute to uh, children's welfare. We've also looked at ways how groundnut production and processing may be improved to save, you know, women's time and energy. And so we've looked at appropriate technologies such as mechanical shellers, you know, planters, as well as looking at, you know, maybe groundnut varieties that may be easier for women uh, to pull from the ground when they're ready to harvest. You know, that is maybe the erect varieties over the creeping ones, uh, things like that. But most importantly, our ag activity in Ghana, uh, we selected it because of the prevalence of aflatoxin uh, in this crop. And that's a big concern, of course, as you all know. 
Uh, we know the adverse health effects of that toxin and what they do to our guts and impair the proper absorption of foods and nutrients. So we have aimed to address this issue by improving production and processing practices at the household level. And there are many practices that can be improved and mostly they follow you know, good agronomic uh, practices that may reduce uh, contamination. Uh, we coordinate our efforts with others, uh, such as the uh, Innovation Lab for uh, Peanut Productivity and Mycotoxin Control. Uh, that's out of the University of Georgia in the US, or it's uh, PMIL for short. Uh, they are engaged in longer term, in long -term research on this. And so we, we, we benefit a lot from their advice as well. And we operate in some of the same areas in Northern Ghana. So uh, and speaking of other partners, uh, we're also in discussions with IITA looking at scaling the field trials of the application of Aflasafe, uh, which, you know, it's a biopesticide, you know, that can control the spread of the toxic strains of the Aspergillus fungus. So, and, and just one other thing that I wanted to mention here, uh, we're also looking at the potential for market premiums for Aflasafe groundnuts because we realize that, you know, in order to sustainably incentivize the production of groundnuts, even though most of this is for harm consumption, but of course, you know, some of them are sold for a little bit of income for women. You know, we want to see if, you know, market traders, wholesalers, processors, et cetera, have, you know, are, are they willing to pay a higher price for groundnuts that are safe from aflatoxin? So uh, those are the various components that we're looking at, uh, but, but, but the main question, how do we determine if the groundnuts are safe from aflatoxin? Of course, there are tests there, you know, that quantify, you know, the, 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 the levels, you know, in parts per billion. Uh, we did not go for that. You know, we aim for simple uh, tests, you know, basically qualitative tests that just say yes or no, you know, your groundnuts are below the 20 parts per billion threshold or above the 20 parts per billion uh, threshold. Uh, basically, because uh, we wanted this to be rapid, you know, and we want the project beneficiaries to also know the results uh, because they consume these groundnuts. And we designed the tests to be conducted over time, you know, at the household level, uh, so that we could capture any variations, you know, any over diseases in the stored groundnuts. Uh, and so the results of these tests are shared with the women farmers as part of ongoing learning and monitoring. And, you know, the, the women are organized into farmer field schools, and the tests are compared against the recommended uh, practices uh, that we have in the farmer field school manual, your know, aflatoxin mitigation practices. And so we want to determine if there are any specific practice that may have caused uh, contamination and what they can do about it. But now, uh, again, on farmer field schools, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, what we're trying to do there, too. We aim to improve the design and delivery of these. So, so far, you know, we're just focusing on groundnuts uh, because we are a nutrition project. But we have nutrition counseling sessions at the health facilities and through health frontline workers. Now, we think that farmer field schools are another venue to reinforce these nutrition messages. Uh, so, so in collaboration with our nutrition colleagues, you know, our staff in Ghana have identified uh, six critical behaviors, six uh, critical among the first thousand day households. Uh, and so we integrate, we aim to integrate, you know, these, these critical uh, messages into the farmer field school sessions. These are simple messages such as, of course, you know, exclusive breastfeeding is there, but feeding on un uncontaminated food, uh, complementary foods for, you know, washing hands, you know, by feeding warm food, giving only boiled water, giving mixed food for diversity, and so on. And now the difference in our approach is how we wish to integrate these messages, not as standalone nutrition education sessions, but as part of the session plans when farmers are learning how uh, a growth of a plant, for example, is affected by the different factors, such as quality of seed, land preparation, um, proper weeding, and so on. And we believe that, you know, their farmers will be able to understand better and appreciate the importance of nutrition interventions, you know, for the growth of uh, their children and for themselves, you know, the women, when we couch these nutrition messages in analogies that are appropriate to the context of the farmers. So I've given you an overview of what we have going on in Ghana, and I, I think I, I, I've actually run out of my 10 minutes, uh, but if you won't mind, I'll just go over a little bit just to mention what we're doing in Sierra Leone, because I think it's interesting. Uh, in Sierra Leone, uh, this is an Ebola response activity. Our footprint is much more limited. Uh, there are other activities uh, financed, you know, financed by USAID that are uh, in the process of being awarded, 
or have been awarded already. And so uh, our study there, you know, is sort of to inform, you know, the learning will inform, you know, what those activities take on. So under uh, nutrition sensitive ag, we've designed a study that analyzes the barriers and enablers to nutrition sensitive agriculture. And we focus on two promising value chains that may contribute to increased diet diversity. And these are fish and pumpkin. You know, we came to these uh, two value chains through a collaborative, collaborative process with our implementing partner on the ground. So just very briefly, uh, you know, because we know that value chain analysis, you know, uh, talks about something else. We're concerned about end markets, quality of relationships between different stakeholders, value chain actors, competitiveness, and so on. But in this adapted value chain analysis, we looked at aspects the effect, that affect the underlying and basic determinants of nutrition, you know, following the definition of nutrition sensitive ag. So these factors for the purpose of this rapid study are, you know, things like availability of the food in local markets on a year round basis, you know, the affordability of fish and pumpkin, you know, to our target consumers. And what are the time and labor burdens imposed by these foods in their production, processing, preparation, or everywhere along the value chain? Uh, what are the hygiene practices associated with these foods among the value chain actors? Uh, and we have another study looking at you know, household level aspects. You know, that's a separate study. And then we also looked at sanitation and environmental aspects leading to human infections and disease. So the report is being finalized, and the findings and results are, will be used to develop a behavior change approach and strategy for actors within these two specific agricultural value chains. So that's where I'll end for now, and I'm happy to take questions after the next presentation. Thank you. And we have a question from Anand Kumar from Care in India. So Anand has a question about um, drudgery reduction, that we all know women are very time constrained and they do a lot of what we call drudgery work um, and how can mechanization play a role in reducing that? And his question was to Victor on and uh, you know how they were experiencing that with their work. So Victor, would you like to step in and answer that? Sure, gladly. Uh, thank you. Unfortunately, you know that question. You know, it's it's, uh, it's one of those aspects that's very hard to uh, monitor and measure. And so, actually, in our project, uh, I would admit that we haven't gone as far as uh, uh, doing the monitoring. So we don't uh, see. You know, what we have is just uh, just evidence here and there, uh, but not in any uh, you know uh, what do you call this uh, statistically significant uh, sort of tests. You know, as much as the as, as maybe some other research, you know, would do. Uh, we are involved in, in coming up with, uh, you know, with some types of uh, monitoring indicators, you know, uh, first specifying a, a specific, you know, outcome uh, statement and then coming up with a reasonable indicator that implementing partners can use in the field. Uh, so what we've done in Ghana so far has been just to introduce some of these, you know, time-saving uh, agricultural technologies to some, just to some, of our farmers. Uh, as you know, we are pretty much also a learning uh, project. You know, we wish to document, you know, the experiences from that, but not in any way to show any uh, statistical, statistically significant reduction in, you know, women's labor burden. I, I know that uh, there is a lot more information in this aspect of the work, you know, with the work that IFPRI is conducting, you know, especially when, you know, the, the WEA, uh, Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index, you know, they measure these variables. And so I would point uh, people, you know, to that body of research, you know, and we're not duplicating their work, you know, we're just uh, enhancing where we can. I hope that uh, satisfies for now. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Victor. And I know from the chat room, Maru, do you have a question? Yes, particularly it's very similar to what has been said, because um, um, as you know, in this session, we are very much interested in the decision-making process. So I'm kindly asking to Pinga, to Mr. Pinga, to understand which are the strong reasons behind the choice of peanuts vis-a-vis uh, -vis other major crop or other activity that could have a, an impact in nutrition, quality-wise, quantity-wise, name it, I mean, given the complexity of nutrition. And again, you know, uh, did you monitor the impact uh, of it? Because this is essential. Thank you. I mentioned briefly, I guess very briefly, that we are part of a much larger effort. And so a lot of the other Feed the Future implementing partners are working on the other crops. 
you know, a lot of them are working on staples as well. There's also a, a more of a food security type uh, project out in the northern regions called Ring, you know, which is resiliency, uh, I believe, in northern Ghana. Uh, and they tackle a lot more other uh, crops. You know, they, they, they also do orange flesh sweet potato. You know, they have uh, looked this spring to distribute some of these vines, you know, to our uh, target districts. So groundnuts is, it was chosen simply because, you know, no one else was working on it. And we know, you know, the, the, the various, the, the many implications it has, you know, on women's health. Uh, and it's also a, a, a food crop, you know, for a lot of households. So, of course, you know, our selection of groundnuts is very incomplete. You know, we didn't mean to be comprehensive uh, in our approach. You know, we are feeding into a much larger effort and all that. So I think, you know, the, the, the question, your question will be, uh, will be relevant, you know, at the portfolio level, we call it, you know, at the, with Feed the Future, you know, in the beginning of the multi-year strategy, you know, they developed, uh, you know, they had a short list of the various uh, commodities value chains that uh, the U.S. government will be investing in. And part of also, you know, that decision process is also what other donors are doing. So it's meant to be complementary. And then, you know, the local government also comes in, you know, the host government, you know, in terms of uh, lay, lay, laying out their, uh, you know, priority crops and all that. But if we look at a specific, you know, for instance, a geographic area, maybe like uh, how ACF has been approaching in their work. You know, I, I agree you know, we need to have, you know, a more systematic uh, approach in, in coming up with which targets to, which crops to target. And, and, and we have done that in our other efforts, which I didn't mention today. Uh, you know, and it, 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 start, it begins with a nutrition context assessment, you know, and so to, to really lay out, you know, where the nutrition gaps are and then maybe you know, uh, steering agriculture so that, you know, it will fill those nutrition, nutrition gaps. So, so it's just not, uh, I've been presented, you know, in the two countries that I spoke about today, but in our other efforts, yes, that's where we would start in a defined geographic space. We look at the nutrition context and identify the nutrition gaps. Thanks. Sorry, can I rapidly fit in also to be uh, propositional, constructive in the dialogue? Don't you think, and I don't want to be old-fashioned because good things don't have age, but uh, in a big efforts like yours would be envisageable to have a healthy, uh, let's say, what we used to call farming system analysis and a quick and dirty uh, uh, definition of which are the um, determinants in malnutrition in that community. Don't you think that that one could guide more than uh, technological and scientific interest the proper uh, uh, focus? Thank you. Uh, yeah, just a quick uh, reaction to that. I agree, definitely farming systems analysis. And it, it will be part of what we would collectively call, you know, the formative research that goes into designing a nutrition uh, project or intervention, uh, formative research or context analysis. Uh, nutrition context assessment, you know, so farming systems analysis is also definitely part of that. Thanks.